chairmanship of the meeting. And uh, with your permission, I would like to say a few words of welcome. Uh, we are assembled here today to mark the 20th uh, Foundation Day, 20th anniversary of the founding of the Research Foundation. In these 20 years, under uh, the guide of our uh, founder, Mr. R. K. Mishra, who at last is no longer with us, yeah, or if, as, a, as, a, as an independent uh, policy think tank, has come a very long way. But this uh, particular occasion today is uh, a poignant moment for us. Nevertheless, we are here together and I welcome all of you, ladies and gentlemen, who have taken the trouble to come and join us today. Uh, Renuka Mishaji, I don't know what to say. It's a special poignant occasion for you, but we deeply appreciate that you are able to join us uh, today. I welcome you. I welcome members of the family. We share, in ORF, we share your sadness, your loss, the, the suffering uh, and the deprivation all of us in ORF have gone through. In uh, uh, our late lamented chairman's memory, we have decided to institute an annual memorial lecture. And uh, this lecture will be delivered, inaugural lecture is being delivered today by a very eminent person from Pakistan, uh, uh, Ambassador uh, Zorani, who had a very good rapport with Mishari. I know that they worked together over a period of time in search of harmony, cooperation, peace between our two countries. Uh, he needs no introduction. He is well known here. He has many friends in this country. And after a long distinguished uh, career in the Pakistan Army, uh, he was appointed uh, uh, to the highest uh, post in diplomacy as the Pakistan ambassador in the United States of America. Then he was their national security advisor. I say no more. Ambassadors of that caliber do not need too long an introduction. Uh, I want to greet you, Mr. High Commissioner. It's good of you to be with us. And I greet equally other members of the diplomatic corps who have been working with us. We have uh, several of our friends, members of parliament, the former minister here, welcome, sir. And uh, uh, Shai, sir, thank you for joining us. Uh, again, a very well, warm welcome, um, ladies and gentlemen to all of you. Uh, I would now request uh, uh, the chairman to give the floor to Mr. Abid Hussain for his introductory remarks. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, Ambassador Mr. Durani, Mr. Rasgotra, Mrs. Mishra, Mr. Goenka, Excellencies and Friends. This is a very important and significant day for our organization, ORF. And I, on behalf of the trustees of ORF, my colleagues in ORF and friends of ORF we welcome you. I said that this is, is a significant day. It is so because today it marks the 20th Foundation Day of an organization. This is an organization which is known as a think tank, no doubt, but it is much more than that. 
it is an organization which not only brings intellectuals, selected scholars, researchers together, but it's an organization which creates an environment and an atmosphere which is mingled with solitary way of pursuing knowledge and a boisterous way of communion with people under the umbrella of God. And therefore, as I said, we feel very happy today that we are able to celebrate the 20th Foundation Day. This day is equally significant or more important for us because today we are meeting here to commemorate the memory of Mr. R. K. Mishra, who was the originator, creator, maker of ORF. He was the man who visualized the need for an institution like ORF. And during his lifetime, tried to provide it with a vision and a drive of which we are proud of. He is no more today, but as you all know, who have come in contact with him, that he is a person who cannot be easily forgotten. His memories are vivid. The thoughts connected with him will continue to grow and envelope a larger number of people in the society. He was a versatile man. He was the many splendid personality, personality one could say. But what was remarkable about him was that though the backdrop of his thinking was politics, he could never become a party to any sectarian group, either in the area of politics or in the area of social welfare and others. Though his imprint was there in almost all these particular sectors, but he kept himself aloof from the smaller loyalties. He was too independent a man to be the follower of anybody. But he was also at the same time a democrat to the core who would not abuse his power or use his personality to subdue others. We remember him distinctly as a friend and philosopher and a guide. The way in which he motivated people in that organization is something marvelous. He used to say, that ORF should be more than a think tank. It should be a place where you intermingle the solidarity that with communion. He was a believer, in fact, that however good and however rich and how powerful a man may be, he cannot be much unless and until he rises up to assume the principles which are high, values which are noble. And it is this which he continuously practiced, and it, the ideas vibrated through him and imbibed by all those who were working over there. He was a political thinker, as I said. He was a great journalist, as most of you know. He was a parliamentarian, and he was a man who quietly and silently advised 
the Prime Minister, three Prime Ministers at least I know, to whom he was very close and was their advisor. He never, never really showed the power which he commanded, no doubt, but never used, as I said earlier. Immense pleasure he used to give when you dialogue with him or talk to him. Never did I find him complaining against anybody. He had no grievances at all, though it has a fact that later, in the later part of his life, he was removing himself from the main current of politics, but the, the politicians were not away from him. Some of them are sitting over here, and I have seen in his house how they used to come, talk to him, pick on his brains, and try to find a way out of the mess into which the politics itself had fallen. So when I say that he is no longer there, it is true in the physical sense. But the great gift which he has left behind us is very much there. That is OR. And as I said, ORF is not only a nationally important think tank, but it is getting globally recognized. And it is being recognized because of the fact that it has been able to gather the best of the brains from all over the world to come to discuss and to perceive of a new vision for tomorrow. OIF has brought out a number of publications. ORF has brought several countries closer than they were before. They were not a mighty chain that he brought about, but the steps which he had taken, the role which he has set, the destiny which he had in mind, was something which was invited. And I am sure that those who are working in ORF have got a great responsibility to keep that flame burning, shining, giving light and igniting new spirit in the country as such. So today when we stand up and think of him, we think of the vision, we think of the ideas which he had given. He was one of those who believed in it, that no country can develop unless and until. It has got an overarching theme or idea to go about. <clears throat> that was the thing he used to emphasize. Let that, that overarching idea be understood by one and all. And then only we can proceed further and find a way out. I am happy that Mr. Raskotra and others who are working in ORF day and night are trying to pursue the theme the ideas which he had in mind. I'm sure that most of you who knew him would agree with him that it is not easy to forget a man like him. It is not easy to eradicate his memory. It is not easy for that memory itself to fade. Today, we are also very happy that in commemoration or in memory of that great man, we are having the memorial lecture. As Mr. Raskotra said, that to start with, we were not thinking in terms of having memorial lectures, but give only scholarships and fellowships. But then we felt that it is extremely necessary that the image of that particular man 
the concept which he had given to ORF and to the country <clears throat> are something which should not be left <clears throat> unknown. And therefore, an annual lecture will be an occasion for us to meet, to think of him, and listen to some of the ideas which will be propounded under this, on, in, on this occasion. We are very happy that the first memorial lecture is being given by an outstanding man from our neighboring country, a distinguished soldier, a person who rose from the ordinary levels to the highest level, a man who was very close to the presidents of Pakistan, a man, I am sure, is a secretary of many memories and many secrets, some of which I hope he will reveal, most of it I am sure he will conceal. <laughs> but then we would like him to know that we in this particular country would very much like to have the best of relations with Pakistan. We admire the way that you are fighting against terrorism over there. We admire the way in which you are trying to curb the power of some of the Imams there. We have a saying in Urdu, Neem Hakim Khatre Jan, Neem Mullah Khatre Iman. And I am sure it is in your interest that these Neem Hakims and Neem Imandars should be controlled. We assure you, sir, that there are many in this particular country who would like to have the best of relations with your country. We belong to that particular school of thought who are very proud of our country. We are very careful about the security of our country. We are very much concerned about the secular atmosphere in this particular country. And it is will be fine. A little bit of upsetting things happening on the other side of the border. I hope you agree we have got every right to feel nothing and bad about it. But there is nothing bad against you or against any individual or groups in that country. We are very happy that you are with us today and I am confident of it that some of the sorrows which you had known, some of the exuberance which was a part of your duty which you performed, would be reflected in what you are going to speak today. I do not wish to take more of your time, and I end with that, handing over the proceedings to Mr. Subramanyam, who does not know him. Maybe he is known more in Pakistan than in India, but then he is a man who have got a strategic mind. He is a man who has been most analytical about the security issues. And I am sure that his presence here also will add to the importance of this evening's function. Subramaniam is a good man and father of a good fellow who has become our ambassador in Beijing. Beijing and Lahore, both are important for us. So here is a man who represents in a way the concern of this country in respect of both those countries. And I'm sure that he is the best person that we could have thought of to preside over today's meeting. With that I end, and I request Mr. Subramaniam to continue with the project. Thank you. Uh, you would uh, forgive my conducting the proceedings sitting uh, because of my uh, state of my health. Uh, I am very happy to be associated with this function. Mrs. Mishra, Mr. Goenka, Mr. 
So let's go through Mr. Vijay Singh and General Durrani, distinguished friends, your excellencies. I came across Mr. Mishra in 1990 when our common friend who is present here, Sayyid Nakvi, took me to him. And uh, Mr. Mishra recruited me as a journalist. And that was the beginning of a new career for me after having spent 37 years in the IAS. I was uh, in his paper and he allowed me at one point of time to write two daily columns a day. This was at the time of the Iraq war. And it so happened I was the only journalist in this country who was writing against Saddam Hussein and arguing that Saddam Hussein should go. He told me he was under considerable pressure to end my writings. But he said, no, he wasn't going to allow me to continue my writing. So that is how my journalist career began. And I have very fond memories of Mr. I've been meeting him since then on a number of occasions and uh, uh, exchanging views with him. So his loss is a great loss to the country. He would have been yeah, an asset for many more years to come if only uh, cancer had not taken him away. And it is very appropriate that uh, General Durrani should be invited to address the first memorial lecture of Mr. Mishra. As Mr. Abid Hussain pointed out, Mr. Mishra was uh, vitally concerned about peace and especially relationship with our neighbors. And uh, General Durrani has a reputation of being General Shanti. I saw, I, I checked up on General Durrani and Wikipedia, he says, it says that in India he is called General Shanti. Therefore, who can you invite better than General Shanti to deliver the first memorial lecture for Mr. Arthurisha. And uh, he has had a very distinguished career. In fact, he was the sword of honor cadet of his batch. And uh, he rose to the rank of Major General. Uh, if he had not retired, most probably, he would have been the Chief of Army Staff, not General Karamat. <coughs> now, I don't want to stand between him and you because he has a very uh, persuasive message to deliver to all of us <coughs> on bridging the gap between Pakistan and India. Pakistan. Mrs. R.K. and I will also mention Mr. 
Mr. Rajesh Misra because he was a link between me and RK. Ladies and gentlemen, it is an absolute honor for me to have been invited by the President of ORF, Mr. Raskotra, to deliver the inaugural lecture in the memory of my friend R.K. Misra. I feel handicapped intellectually, but my commitment to peace between our two countries for the good of our people is total. It is this commitment which gave me the strength to accept Mr. Raskotra's invitation. Mr. R.K. Misra, my friend and the late chairman of ORF, worked tirelessly for peace between our two countries. While we both remain steadfast in our objective of peace between our two nations, we did occasionally differ on the how. I hope my submissions today here will please RK's spirit. I also take this opportunity to say farewell to him. Farewell RK, may your journey be a peaceful one in the hereafter. I evoke the blessings of the Almighty on your soul. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a pleasure for me to be here in India to talk about the subject nearest to my heart, which is improving relations between our two countries. Globalization is a fact of life, and planet Earth is like a series of interconnected spaces in which resources, pollution, scarcity, security, etc., affect all of us. The sooner we understand this and learn to live together for the betterment of individuals and collective good. It has been said often enough, war is no more an option between India and Pakistan, and this has been recognized by the leadership of both sides. So let us give peace and friendship a helping hand. In my opinion, the acrimony between India and Pakistan has not allowed the South Asia region to develop its full potential. I am certain if Pakistan, India, and I'll also include Afghanistan, had good working relations, each could play an important role to develop and improve <coughs> energy, trade, and communication infrastructures in the region to make South Asia a hub of economic activity that yields mutually beneficial results for its entire population. <coughs> Geographically, Pakistan has the potential to be the trade and energy pivot for the extended region. I believe good relations between our countries are an economic and security compulsion, not only for us, but also for the growth of South Asia and the extended region. I would like to make a brief mention of our extended region in which South Asia is at a centerpiece. The extended region as I see it stretches from the Middle East and Iran in the west up to and maybe beyond Thailand in the east and to the north inclusive of Central Asia. I am convinced there is great potential for trade, sharing energy, academic and cultural exchanges, expanding of democratic traditions, and maybe at some stage in our history, even the development of an interlocking security infrastructure. In a globalized world, we have to aware of the geostrategic and economic interests of other world powers in our region. The U.S. is already involved in and around our region. And we cannot discount the strategic interests of Russia, Europe, and others. Hopefully, we will learn not to be sucked into their rivalries, or into the rivalries of these external powers. 
Friendship with all should be our guiding principle, of course, without compromising our national and possibly our regional interests. The two regional forums, which could be models for us as our ASEAN and the European Union. To many in India and Pakistan, modeling after the European Union and the South Asian uh, gathering is a pipe dream. But I honestly believe that if India and Pakistan can get their act together, a strong, potent SARC is within our reach. Again, an effective SARC would not only improve our collective bargaining position in various world forums, but would enhance the prestige of individual countries, especially biggest part India. Collectively, we could manage the geostrategic interests of other world powers in our neighborhood. In addition, collectively, we could efficiently resolve the primary problem of our people, which, as we all know, is poverty. The answer is a more cooperative and less competitive relationship between us. Frankly, never in our history has there been a greater need to bridge the gap which continues to divide us. Since our very creation, we have perceived each other as serious security threats. Being a smaller country, the sense of insecurity has been greater in Pakistan. Today, for the first time, we face a common threat. A threat which, if not contained and rejected, will surely destroy us peacefully. It will destroy the secular credentials that our forefathers had enunciated for both our countries. Terrorism, religious bigotry, intolerance, and a warped sense of nationalism are the numerous facets of this threat. I can assure you time is not on our side. We have to fight this threat jointly and move beyond the usual rhetorical statements and the blame game. Why does this threat thrive in countries like Pakistan and India? Essentially, poverty, illiteracy, poor quality education, lack of social justice, and poor governance are the main ingredients which provide a fertile soil for the growth of criminality, extremism, and terrorism. Indeed, today it is Pakistan which is facing the brunt of this threat in the form of Al-Qaeda, Taliban, and narrow-minded bigotry. But it would be naive not to see the signs of this threat in India. Ayodhya, Gujarat, Mumbai, Kashmir represent the leading edge of this threat in India. While this threat annoying at our vitals, what are we doing about it collectively? A lot of blame and counter blame. To me it seems the Mumbai investigation is being conducted through the media with due respect to the media. I do not understand why India and Pakistan are unable to field a joint investigation team. At some point in time, we have to move beyond our mistrust, and that time is now. I have no doubt that the overwhelming majority of the people in India and Pakistan want the establishment of a permanent peace between our two countries. I recollect the euphoria in both countries when Mr. Vajpayee visited Lahore to meet his counterpart. I see the same desire for friendship when I roam around Chandni Chowk or even go to the Delhi Golf Club for my fish tikka fix. Where then is the problem? In the past I had felt that it is the historic mistrust amplified by the wars that we have fought. I now realize that the problem is far more complex and needs to be addressed on a broad front. In all humility and with the deepest of respects to many of my friends who are here 
in this audience. Bureaucratic inertia, especially among the security agencies, is another major obstacle to a forward movement. In the final decision to move forward, if the, uh, sorry, if the final decision to move forward is contingent on approval by the security agency, then with every step forward, we will continue to take two steps backwards. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the most important element for forward movement is strong political will. A political will which can override the negative static produced by the establishment. The main reason why the late R.K. Misra and I could not complete our mission was because of the ifs and buts of the entrenched establishment who were able to sway the political leadership on both sides. Surprisingly, the political leadership has time and again shown the will, but it seems they were not strong enough to overrule the establishment. While we take other steps to bring India and Pakistan closer, removing or at least reducing the mistrust between our people, our establishments, our media, and above all, our security agencies is essential. This mistrust is historic and accentuated by recent events like Mumbai, carnage, for which I offer my deepest sympathy to the people of India. Killing of innocent people, whatever the cause, is abhorrent. In my understanding, the deep-rooted mistrust cannot be removed by a decree, but only through patient and sincere dialogue at multiple forums, plus reaching verifiable agreements and a step-by-step mechanism to resolve disputes, starting with the simpler disputes and going to the more complex issues. This, of course, does not imply inertia. I have, I am afraid I have no magic pill, or for that matter, Amradhara, and will outline some of the steps which have been presented time and again by various forums and even in my small little book, India and Pakistan, The Cost of Conflict and the Benefits of Peace. At the cost of repetition, I will re-emphasize dollar. Without dialogue, the relationship comes to a standstill. I am sure there are more effective ways to express displeasure rather than break dialogue. For the credibility of the dialogue process, it is important to achieve meaningful progress. A dialogue should not turn into a game between the bright boys of the foreign service to score minor diplomatic victories and lose the war of peace. Here again, the driving force behind the formal dialogue process has to be the political leadership. I will come back to this a little later. People to people track two, of which I have been a member, are very useful and effective interactions. It is this official channel, unofficial channel of communication which, besides developing an effective lobby for peace, tests out new ideas and acts as a sounding board for the official channel. It is important to understand that the track to channel can only be helpful in a meaningful way if it is independent of the two governments. Track 2 should influence the governments rather than be influenced by them. I strongly recommend and support Track 2 efforts between our two countries. The requirement of Track 2 is greater when the official level talks stop. Another equally important track is the back channel. And as we all know, this almost secret channel worked effectively during the times of the BJP government here in India and the Nawaz Sharif and Musharraf governments in Pakistan. Quite honestly, I am not sure what the status of the back channel is today. 
I would urge the two governments to utilize this channel. Though representing the highest political leadership of the two countries, the back channel has the advantage of deniability and is able to develop innovative solutions away from the glare of publicity and public debate. The back channel should not and cannot replace the former dialogue, but its usefulness is undeniable. We will now discuss some of the other activities which will support peace and reconciliation. In my assessment, the three most powerful instruments which can help build bridges are the media, academia, and the business community. I know there are institutional linkages between these instruments, but unfortunately, they don't seem to be focused on friendship and building bridges. Some elements in the media are busy dramatizing the differences and adding fuel to the fire. I believe this type of activity almost caused a war after the recent Bombay carnage. The Pakistani media has come a long way and is now a powerful instrument like their colleagues here in India. Does the media reflect public opinion or more public opinion? Speaking for Pakistan, I believe the media is molding public opinion and at times filling in for the political leadership. Is it asking too much of the media to work towards developing a better understanding between our two peoples? It would be exciting to embed correspondence between the media of our two countries to gain perspective of the other side. I would be delighted if some journalist from India go and work with the news, the dawn, and similarly, we have Pakistani journalists working with your major networks. This is my challenge to the media on both sides. I place great stock on the positive role of the media if they indeed decide to lead the peace offensive. Today, I was delighted to learn that the Times of India and Jung Group in Pakistan have already embarked on this venture. I am aware that there has been some exchange of faculty and students amongst the educational institution, institutes, but these need to expand by a factor of at least 100. Some of the old boys' networks exist, but old boys like me are getting too old or disappearing from the scene altogether, and therefore the requirement to pump in new blood. I would urge the private academic institutions to take the lead as they are less hamstrung by government rules and regulation. There have been cases where free medical assistance was provided to a few Pakistani families by medical institutions in India. Very commendable indeed. Why can't universities and colleges in both countries offer scholarships to students from the other country? Scholarships, exchange students and visiting faculty would go a long way to reduce the mistrust in the new generation. I am convinced there is phenomenal scope for enhanced trade and business between our two countries. However, a large number of industrialists and businessmen in Pakistan are worried that India could swamp Pakistan with its goods and destroy Pakistani industry. I would therefore recommend an incremental approach and not kicking the door open. Likewise, I would recommend a level playing field. Traders and businessmen could become the biggest stakeholders in this process. Transit of Indian goods for the Afghan market and beyond is a thorny issue being dealt with at the official level. However, Pakistan can only become a true trade and energy hub as it desires if there is increased trade between India and Pakistan. I would like to re-emphasize that this should be done incrementally 
as a win-win proposition. It may not be possible today, but ladies and gentlemen, the future lies in a free flow of goods and services in SARC and the region, region beyond. Coming back to the former dialogue, or what we now call the composite dialogue, I have a few comments and two suggestions to offer for consideration of our two governments. I believe we have completed four rounds of the composite dialogue since January 2004. Yes, we have made some progress, but I believe the forward movement is painfully slow. Many a times both parties repeat their respective positions and call it a day. This respectfully is not my understanding of a meaningful dialogue. Forward movement can only be achieved in a spirit of give and take and not dictation by one or the other party. I understand some issues are intricate and cannot be resolved in a few meetings, but to maintain the credibility of the composite dialogue, we need to make brisk progress on many of the issues which are eminently doable. How does, for example, how does police reporting help in the visa? Or how does restricting the point of entry help? Or for that matter, how does restricting the number of places to be visited help either country or its security? This kind of regime may have been relevant about a hundred years ago. But in this time and age, in my mind, it is an embarrassment for both countries. Ladies and gentlemen, I believe India and Pakistan are the closest of kin born out of the same soil. However, the 60 odd years of adversarial relationship has created a major gap in our understanding of each other. It has dehumanized the relationship. Today the common man in India feels that every female in Pakistan is under a burqa and walking three steps behind her Talibanized husband. <laughs> a lady I spoke with in India was surprised to discover that females in Pakistan speak fluent English. Similarly, there is a strong belief in Pakistan that Muslims in India are second class citizens, constantly being chased by saffron clad Hindu extremists. Ladies and gentlemen, there is an urgent need to humanize the relationship, to show each other that deep down we are all humans, no different from each other, following the same broad moral principles, with the same desires and aspirations to live decent lives. I have two broad recommendations to bridge this gap. First is what I have already talked about, is the opening up of the visa regime between our two countries. I mean really opening up. Second, allowing broadcast of TV programs, other media from one country to the other. I can watch all the TV channels of India and Pakistan, but I believe my friends here in Delhi cannot watch TV, Pakistani TV channels. I don't understand why. Is it possible that the Indian establishment is worried about the cultural invasion from Pakistan? <laughs> I really seriously doubt it. Ladies and gentlemen, the circuit issue has been lingering since the creation of our countries. In fact, even before that. I believe today the issue is ripe for a solution. Minor differences need to be resolved or brushed away by the political leadership. I was informed by two naval officers, one, two naval officers, one from Pakistan and one from India, that delaying the resolution of the circuit issue will be against the national interest of both countries. Maybe Admiral Nayyar, whom I can see, can throw some light on this. CHN is yet another solvable issue. We are losing precious lives in an inhospitable terrain and wasting vast resources. 
both countries lose more lives to weather than hostile action. I am told we came very close to a solution till one of the countries backed up. As a beginning, we must demilitarize the CHN region. As a follow-up, we may consider declaring CHN a common heritage and establishing a joint glacial research center which will help both countries to manage the water resources. The Indus Water Treaty of 1960 is an example where Pakistan and India were able to sign on to a fairly complex agreement. This is a tribute to the maturity and flexibility shown by both countries. I think it is in our joint interest to preserve the letter and spirit of the Indus Water Treaty and resolve issues like Wooler Lake and Kishan Ganga waters through its mechanism. The question is, why are we not able to move in the same spirit today to resolve our other problems and issues? During my last visit to Delhi uh, as the National Security Advisor from Pakistan, the Honorable Prime Minister of India assured me that India would follow the letter and spirit of the Indus Water Accord and that Pakistan would receive its due share of water. I found that very reassuring as I trust your Prime Minister's words. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, as I mentioned at the outset, terrorism is the most serious threat to our national security <coughs> and we need to fight this menace jointly. Unfortunately, the Joint Anti-Terrorist Mechanism, or what it, they call it, JTM, has not achieved much. I feel there is an urgent need to expand the JTM to include senior representatives of security and intelligence agencies. Instead of using the media and accusing each other for supporting and abetting terrorism, there is a need for a serious catharsis between our intelligence agencies. Today, there is a firm belief amongst the intelligence and security community in Pakistan that India actively supports insurgency in Baluchistan. And some even believe that India has a hand in the turbulence in Fatah. I was also assured by my friends in India that Pakistan security agencies are considered equally involved in destabilizing India. I feel we need to move beyond this state of affairs. This can only be done through a frank and candid dialogue between our security and intelligence services. Incidentally, ladies and gentlemen, I have personally known over six bosses of the ISI, a few senior to me and the rest junior to me, and most of them were my colleagues in the army. Without exception, all were honorable professional soldiers trying to serve their country to the best of their ability. Luckily, I came to personally know at least two raw chiefs and one IB chief. Probably the IB chief is there today, thanks to the track too. Like my own countrymen, I found the Indian spy masters equally professional and decent human beings. I therefore feel confident that after a couple of meetings, the spy masters could learn to work together for a joint good. I have made a number of comments on selected items of the composite dialogue. I now dare to make two recommendations which I believe will benefit the common man in both countries. Most of my countrymen, an equally large percentage of Indians live in the rural areas and are dependent on the agro-economy. I have driven through the breadth of Indian Punjab and visited two modern farms there. One farm was focused on improving the yield of sugarcane and wheat, while the other farm was in the business of producing organic fertilizer. I am confident there will be enormous benefits for our people by cooperating in this non-controversial sector. 
as most of Pakistan and Indian land masses are in arid region, we should, I recommend, set up a joint India-Pakistan arid agriculture research center. My choice of location would be Chandigarh, the beautiful city. But place it in Multan, if you like the game, or wherever. I urge both countries to include agriculture as a major component of the composite dialogue. Ladies and gentlemen, energy is the lifeblood for the economic growth of both our countries. And unfortunately, we are deficient in this community. In fact, today, Pakistan has a full-blown energy crisis. I'm sure you're aware of it. Besides moving on the stalled John pipeline project, we need to cooperate in areas like water, coal, wind, and solar energy. Ideally, we should set up a common electric grid which will allow Pakistan to buy electricity from India. The system should also allow a reverse flow of electricity from Pakistan to India. Therefore, my second suggestion is that energy too should become a major component of the composite dialogue. Both agriculture and energy are very important and also non-controversial with benefits for the common man. Before I wrap up, I will touch upon Kashmir. I am very sure very few, people, very few people in this audience are aware that I started my schooling in Sirina. My father in his wisdom decided to send me to a burning school. Where goes it? Burn Hall in Sirinagar in 1947. While I was still under seven years of age and living in Abdabad, my childhood memories of Sirinagar are of a beautiful place with houseboats, shikaras, the Dal Lake, gushing streams, and a wonderful, peace-loving people. Kashmir, ladies and gentlemen, is in my blood, as both my mother and my wife are Kashmiris. I am not going to push the Pakistani official line because our foreign office and our high commissioner, I am sure, remind you of that frequently. <laughs> Nor will I advance a new formula for the solution of this lingering dispute. My only submission is that the people of Kashmir have suffered immensely. They need peace and space to rebuild their lives. I will support any solution which is acceptable to the majority of the Kashmir, the bottom line, Kashmir for the Kashmir. I will now, ladies and gentlemen, summarize my recommendations, which to the best of my intention are to bring the people of India and Pakistan closer and reduce the acrimony between our two states. So I'll list them, there are a couple of them. First is strengthen SAR so that it truly becomes a forum for the good of the people and not treat it as shark. Terrorism, religious bigotry and intolerance are a common threat to both India and Pakistan. We need to work together before the threat destroys our way of life. Let our governments give teeth to the JTM and move beyond meaningless statements. Chiefs of our primary intelligence agency need to have periodic meetings to bridge their differences and cooperate in counter-terrorism. We must not interrupt dialogue between our two countries, whatever the provocation. Communicate your anger, frustration, and fuse through dialogue. Lack of dialogue helps neither country. I am not in favor of a dialogue just for the form, but primarily, primarily to move forward. Track two efforts need to be supported and encouraged. The back channel needs to be revived to help the primary dialogue process and address thorny issues. The media, the academic community, and the businessmen in both countries need to play a forceful role in bringing the two people together and reducing the mistrust. Simplifying the visa process drastically. Abolish police reporting and city-specific visas. We should treat each other at least like we treat other foreigners, if we are unable to treat each other in a better fashion. 
Both countries should open up the airways. The Sir Creek and CHN issues are ripe for resolution. Let us put them behind us. We should set up a joint glacial research center at CHN. The Indus Water Treaty of 60 must be respected by both parties and all water disputes should be settled in the letter and spirit of this treaty. No smart reinterpretation is placed. Give space to the suffering Kashmiris. Guiding principle I have already enunciated. Include cooperation in the field of agriculture as a component of the composite dialogue. Set up an Indo Park Arid Agriculture Research Center. Include cooperation in energy as a component of the composite dialogue. Lastly, but most important, is the role of the political leadership in bridging the gap between our nations. They need to show the resolve to guide the dialogue process to its logical conclusion. Ladies and gentlemen, born out of the same soil, unfortunately, India and Pakistan have had a turbulent relationship since the very beginning. Although it was the intention of the founding fathers that India and Pakistan should live together as friendly neighbors, but unfortunately, the relationship began to unravel at the beginning and we landed up fighting a number of wars. There is, I understand, a small but well entrenched segment of the Pakistan society which believes that there can never be friendly relations between our two countries. I believe that such a sentiment also exists in India. However, I think the vast majority of Indians and Pakistanis share my desire of peaceful coexistence. I believe a strong, stable and prosperous Pakistan is in the best interest of India. Just as a vibrant, dynamic and robust India is good for Pakistan and the whole region, destabilizing Pakistan would be a very short-sighted and counterproductive policy for India. Similarly, Pakistan has to accept and respect India as the big brother. I have outlined a number of steps which if followed with commitment will launch us in the direction of peace and cooperation. Our biggest challenge, ladies and gentlemen, as we all know, is to reduce the mistrust that exists between our two nations. Not an easy undertaking, but very much doable. I thank you for your attention. among the ASEAN countries. And therefore, European Union is the right role model for all of us. But let us look back. In 1945, European Union had ended three centuries of bloody wars. Millions of people had died in the war among them. If at that stage somebody had asked, in Europe, could you think of the, uh, the European Union of the type which has emerged now? I don't think anybody could have talked about it because he has referred to it. European Union looks to some of us like a pipe dream. At that stage in 1945, European Union would not even have looked as a pipe dream. 
You would have been looked like a, something which is totally out of this world. But still, in about 30 to 40 years, the European Union emerged. Why? What happened? What happened was this. There were some countries in Europe which were democracies. There were other countries in Europe which were not democracies. And that is what caused the war. And once this systemic disharmony got eliminated, Germany, Italy, Spain, Portugal, Greece became democracy. The European Union could emerge. What is holding European Union today is democracy. If today European Union takes more and more countries after prescribing for them standards of democracy, and only if they fulfill those standards of democracy, then they are taken in. It is often said, no two democracies have for a war. Therefore, what is the problem here? Why did we quarrel on so many issues? Because there has been a systemic disarmory from 1947. which of course, some people trace to the Cold War. And the Cold War imposed its disarmony on the Indian subcontinent, or on the subcontinent. Fortunately, for the first time, in the year 2008, the entire subcontinent from Afghanistan to Bangladesh from Bhutan to Sri Lanka and Maldives, all the countries of Sark became democratic. For the first time, which has not happened before. Therefore, for the first time, we are now in a position not to have pipe dream, but little more than that. We are on a new path. We are starting on it. But then what is the problem? The problem is, will this be enduring? Because if you take all the wars between India and Pakistan, they all happened when there was a military government in Pakistan. 65, 71, 99. 99, you will say, there was a civilian government. But then that civilian government was not in, wouldn't fulfill the full definition of a democratic government. In Pakistan, I used to hear a joke. The joke is, in Pakistani government, either a general is sitting on the chair or standing behind the chair. So, excepting for those years of Zulfikar and Bhutto, you didn't have that. And that is the main reason. And those years of Zulfikar and Bhutto was years when India and Pakistan relationship didn't have much tension. Therefore, we have to now look at the reason for this tension. The reason for this tension is the tension between a democratic and a non-democratic system. That is common all over the world. There is nothing new here. And therefore, now we have got to build, now we have reached this stage, we have got to build on it. We have got to ensure that the democracy in all the Sark countries will be preserved, will be strengthened. <coughs> but then, 
You cannot have democracy unless it is also secular. General Durrani referred to the secular vision of the founding father of Pakistan. True. But it didn't last. The reason for that is, unless you give the power to legislate for the society to the people's representatives of that society, it cannot be democratic. If somebody denies it, that society is not democratic. If somebody says, you cannot legislate on the following issues, then it's not democratic. Now, if you take Catholic Church, the Catholic Church does not approve of abortion. It does not approve of divorce. But the Catholic Church does not question the right of the legislators to legislate for them. The only advice people don't vote for those people who would legislate it. But once the legislation is passed, they don't question that. But if the, there are people or there is a system in which you say, no, you cannot legislate for certain things because the legislature is not fully sovereign, then you cannot be a democracy. Therefore, the, till now we had all these problems because of this basic disarmony. Then, let's again go back to Europe. <coughs> How did Europe have peace? They had an Eretzika accord. In that one of the first principles of that accord is no border or line inherited from the Second World War will be disturbed. It is on that basis they proceeded further and that resulted in the unification of Germany. Therefore, you should start here. Similarly here, we should start with that. For some period, we will not talk in terms of disturbing any lines of controls or borders. We should start here saying that Democracy should be preserved in all the countries. And now today, in democracy in South Asia, there is an international stake. There are 24 countries of NATO operating in Afghanistan to ensure a democratic election. And there are people who say that they have a stake in democracy in Pakistan. Yes, we have a stake in it. We are a stakeholder. All of us are stakeholders in democracies in all countries. And therefore, it is only by sustaining democracy you will be able to preserve peace. You will be able to negotiate Negotiating and reaching settlements is a sense of the democratic spirit. And when you reject democracy, you reject all that. That is what has been happening in the last six years of our history. Now, this democracy is being threatened today, as General Durrani rightly said, by terrorism. But, once when I was speaking, speaking about terrorism in the United States, in one of the preeminent uh, think tanks, somebody came and told me, why bother about it? Terrorism happens in the world in cycles. It always had before. I said, no. The terrorism we are facing today is unprecedented in history. Why? Before, in history, you never had a suicide bomber as the principal instrumentality of terrorism.
Now, a suicide bomber is unstoppable. How are suicide bombers produced? I read in the Pakistani press articles. Children taken at seven years. Condition for seven to ten years. Becomes suicide <coughs> They threaten democracy all over the world, not only in those respective countries, but all over the world. Because they can be sent to anywhere. And they have been sent into various places. Whether it is in Jakarta, whether it is in Bali, whether it is in our country. Or what happened to Ahmad Shah Masood? Therefore, one has to now fight this terrorism in a new form of terrorism. <coughs> and that has to be fought. It is not, yes, in a sense it is because of poverty. It is because of poverty, the children of seven years and ten, ten years get to those places where they are conditioned. Yes, that is true. There should be a way of rectifying that. But then, what I am worried about, fear today, is this. Again, democracy means the ultimate monopoly of the use of force should be with the state. Not with other organizations. If you have that, you cannot be a democracy. You are a democracy in deep danger. In 1923, Mussolini marched his fascists from all over Italy on Rome. There were so many of them in, in the tens of thousands, and the King yielded and made Mussolini the Prime Minister. Now, what happens today in a fragile democracy? There are people armed militias march on the capital, also reinforced by 100 or 200 suicide bomber youngsters. <coughs> Is it possible to stop them at times? Therefore, we are going to think about the, these problems today. The threat to democracy, which is the common threat to us, as General Durani said. And once the entire South Asia becomes democratic, we would be in a position to negotiate peacefully with mutual accommodation various issues. And therefore, let us all help in defending democracy. As it happens, President Obama has pledged he is going to help in stabilizing the democracy in Pakistan. Because there are many Pakistanis who do not see him doing that or who do not agree that he has a jurisdiction to do it. But the fact remains that the entire international community is, has a stake today in the consolidation of democracy in the whole of South Asia. And therefore, we should now look at the basic problem. That basic problem is how do we promote democracy and secularism as the basis on which all differences can be settled. That is how I would look at the facts presented by General Durani. He has given us quite a lot to think about <coughs> and uh, I hope our dialogue in this way would continue and uh, 
they should be in a position to act. Some of the things which he said are very good, like we can't even really see the Pakistani team in this country. I mean, it used to be so. About five, six years ago, we used to see the Pakistan team in, in this country. I don't know when it was stopped. Therefore, I think we should be very grateful to General Durrani to have given us uh, meat for thought. And uh, I thank him for that. Thank you very much. Uh, my first thanks uh, go to Ambassador Durrani. <coughs> Sir, you have given us uh, in your uh, uh, very comprehensive address, a whole wealth of ideas. Uh, we in ORF are doing a lot of uh, research on India-Pakistan relations. And uh, we take these ideas on board, we'll be examining them, we'll be taking up um, uh, with uh, specialists on Pakistan affairs, India-Pakistan affairs. And uh, we'll keep in touch with you as to how to go about uh, implementing, uh, if not all, at least some of these suggestions. Your address uh, carries a very strong ring of sincerity and is suffused with the spirit of uh, uh, conciliatoriness, conciliation and peace. Uh, I am sure uh, uh, it will be uh, very, very welcome uh, uh, news for a lot of our media. I think your criticism of media in both countries is fully justified, uh, but uh, we live with the media. and. Uh, the media has its role. Uh, uh, Mr. Subramaniam, I owe you a very special thanks. I, I, I know that you don't go out very often now, uh, but on my urging, uh, you took the trouble. Uh, we are very, very grateful, and uh, we appreciate very much your presidential remarks. We take very careful note of the suggestion you have made. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we are... Uh, indebted to you for your time. It was very, very good of you to come and join us. I thank you all. Thank you.